Hi, everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn from the Night Live programming team. And I'm Christina, event producer. Thanks for tuning in. It's been quite a smoky orange skied week here in San Francisco and the West Coast. And there's no single word to really encapsulate all the fields of 2020, but we wanted to just take a moment to say, hope you're all staying safe and well out there. Um, we missed you all last week, but are excited to be back with tonight's night school. We have a pretty eclectic lineup and we'll be traveling from coast to coast with our featured guests tonight. Dr. Rebecca Johnson and Allison Young, co-directors of the Academy Citizen Science Program are joining us from the Bay Area to talk about tide pools and why they're so cool and why they would both basically like to spend all of their time there. Um, we have Alex Troutman, a wildlife biologist joining us from Virginia tonight to talk about working on the Gulf Coast with the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, considered both the smallest sea turtle in the world and also the most endangered. And then finally, uh, Dr. Eileen Maldonado joins us from the Florida Keys where she will pull herself away from watching corals and waiting for them to spawn uh, to talk about her research there and the fascinating world of unseen chemical communication between marine organisms. As a reminder, tonight's program is live, so please say hi and share any comments and questions in the chat. We'll have some time for Q&A throughout the night. And up first, here's Rebecca and Allison. Hi everyone, good evening. Hello. Um, I'm, I'm Rebecca. And I'm Allison. <laughs> um, we're so happy to be here tonight. Um, take a break from the apocalyptic times out there and talk to you about one of our favorite places on earth and to hear from other speakers about the, the animals and the um, ocean life that they study. So without further ado, we're gonna start a little slideshow here. Um, so tonight we were going to, going to talk to you about California coast tide pools, um, the in, rocky inner tidal. And when we say inner tidal, we mean the place where the land meets the sea. And that could be a sandy beach, that could be lots of places, but tonight we're going to talk mostly about the rocky inner tidal um, that is the most dramatic and in my opinion the most beautiful in Northern California. So that's where we will be focusing. Next slide, Allison. Allison's going to share the advance the slides tonight. So this, these places along the California coast are some of the most beautiful and magical in the world. And this is an amazing picture that Allison took of me up on the Sonoma County coast. And I mean, arguably, like this is just incredible, right? And it's magical and so beautiful. And one of the, and one of the places that you can see probably the greatest diversity of life anywhere else you can on land, right? So, um, and you can see it all by just walking out from a beach. But one of the things that makes it the most cool and the most magical is you can't just go any old time. So next slide. Um, this is a reef that we work most, to spend most of our time at. It's called Pillar Point. It's where the Maverick Surf Contest happens. Um, you can see this beautiful rocky reef exposed at low tide. And so we can go out and go tide pooling and explore only at low tide. On the west coast of North America, we have two low tides and two high tides every day. We go at the lowest low tide. Um, and so you have to know when to go and you have to go at the right time. You can find yourself a tide table. You can Google it to find your place to see when your low tides are. But I kind of want to show you the difference because it's pretty dramatic. So next slide. This is um, Pillar Point where we do our work at high tide, right? This just looks like a regular beach. You walk along the sandy beach and then next, this is it at a low tide, right? So it's like a huge expanse of rocky area where many, many seaweeds and animals spend their lives. And that's where we do our work with a team of volunteers. So we're gonna give you a little sneak peek to see what that looks like or a little momentary peek. Um, you know, this is why, like Christina said, Allison and I would spend almost all our time here if we could. But one of the things that, like I said before, that makes it extra special is you can only go at certain times. So it's even more special because you cannot literally spend all of your time here. So you can see just the amazing diversity of invertebrates and seaweeds that Allison will walk you through. You'll learn a little bit more about them. Um, and that's just a close up view. And this is what this reef looks like. This is kind of close to sunset. You can see a lot of the volunteers that come out with us to do monitoring, enjoying this 
amazing sunset that maybe ironically was also on a smoky evening, <laughs> um, much like the one we're having tonight. So the tide pools, one of the reasons they're most the most amazing is that different parts of the tide pools are exposed to differing amounts of water and air at different times. So you can imagine, you know, the parts closest to the shore are barely ever covered completely by water. But as you move away from shore, a lot of those places are always covered by water except at the extreme low tides. So there's a huge gradient of environmental variables. And it's easier for people who aren't really experienced with tide pools to think about this like elevation. Like if you go from sea level up to tip, top of a mountain, you go through lots of different environmental variables that leads to different plants living at those different bands. So Allison's gonna walk you through this in the tide pools and it will make a lot more sense. Right. Yeah. So like Rebecca said, like if you imagine walking from like the ocean to the top of a mountain, you're going to go through lots of different habitats. But the cool thing about the tide pools and one of the reasons they're so incredibly diverse is that you can walk through a number of different habitats in the span of just a few feet. Um, so it's really amazing. So this graphic here kind of shows you the different factors that kind of lead to the different groups of organisms you find in the tide pool. So like Rebecca said, if you're up in the splash zone or the high intertidal, you're out of the water almost all the time, except at the very highest high tides that might only happen every couple weeks. So you have to be able to deal with, um, you know, being and living in the air and being in the sun and being exposed to warm temperatures. Um, versus as you go down into the low inner tidal, these are areas that are underwater almost all the time, except during the very, very lowest low tides. And so down there, because you're underwater almost all the time, the main factor down there is just competition for space. Um, and if you ever have a chance to walk out in the tide pools, you'll notice this, that up in the high intertidal, there's a lot of more bare rock because not nearly as many organisms can deal with those environmental variables versus when you go down into the low intertidal, everything's super crowded. Everything's kind of competing for space down there. So one of the things I'm going to do is kind of take you on a virtual walk from the high inter high intertidal on the northern California coast to the low intertidal. But I want to uh, just make sure and we're being really clear that we're only scratching the surface of tide pool diversity that if you're out there on a good low tide and you can spend a couple hours out on a rocky reef, that you can find over 200 species easily. Um, so in this uh, kind of virtual walk through the tide pools, I'm gonna show you kind of the more common things that you can find out there. And I'm only showing you about 35 species total. Um, so we definitely recommend uh, making sure that you can go out there, get, try to get out there if you can and experience all the diversity for yourself. So like I said, in the high intertidal, not as nearly, uh, not very many organisms can tolerate being out of the water for so long. So you're going to find a lot of bare rock. But some of the creatures you will find are things like limpets and these little brown barnacles. There's these little snails called periwinkles that you can find up in the high intertidal. And there's a few species of algae that can tolerate being out of the water so much, like this little rockweed, little rockweed right here. Um, when you hit the mid intertidal, you know you're in the mid intertidal when you start seeing mussel beds here along the California coast. They're like the indication that you're in the mid intertidal. Lots of things live in and on mussel beds, um, like clusters of gooseneck barnacles also like to live in the mussel beds themselves. An organism that you might find in the mid intertidal or the low intertidal are these ochre stars. They're like our iconic West Coast California sea star um, that we have out here and mussels are their favorite food. Um, so they can move throughout the tide pools pretty easily. And so you'll often find them mixed in with the mussels as they're having their lunch. If you start looking in the cracks in the mid intertidal, you're like, likely to find these um, shore crabs. There's a few different species out there like these two here, which are pretty cute. Chitons are another good thing that you can find in the mid intertidal. Um, they're mollusks, they just attach to the rock and they don't really go anywhere. Um, but you'll know you find chitons if you find these organisms with these eight plates down their back. And all it takes is kind of looking carefully at the rocks to start finding chitons when you walk through the mid intertidal. You're very likely to find some closed anemones. So anemones, when they're out of the water, tend to close themselves up so they can uh, retain their moisture. And these aggregating anemones are one of the more common mid intertidal anemone species. So sometimes you'll see them like they look on the left where they're pretty obviously closed anemones, but sometimes they're a little tricky and they're on like the ones on the right here where they've actually attached rocks and shells and sand um, to their bodies as well. So they camouflage really well. Um, but these are both examples of aggregating anemones. 
And the algae in the mid intertidal, there's lots and lots of different species, but the, um, they tend to all be kind of these red turf, like smaller red algae um, throughout the intertidal. Lots of different ones though, if you look up close. And now when you move into the low intertidal, these are species that you might find if you're looking in a tide pool, or if you're out during a really low tide, you might find some of these things out of the water. So um, we have these Anthropleura anemones on the California coast here, like the sunburst anemone and the giant green anemone. And you can see down in the corner there, um, some open aggregating anemones as well. Like I said, those ochre stars, can definitely move throughout the tide pool. So you're likely to find them in the low intertidal as well. But there are some species of sea stars that you pretty much only spend time in the low intertidal, like these bat stars or these leather stars. Uh, one of uh, many people's favorite intertidal organisms, once you start to get to know them and know how to find them, are nudibranchs. Um, they're these amazingly brightly colored sea slugs that are pretty small, um, but they are throughout the low intertidal. Um, and if you look really carefully and you spend some time in one tide pool looking closely, you're likely to find some of these nudibranchs out there in the low intertidal. Snails you can find kind of throughout the tide pools, these snails on the left, these tegula snails um, kind of are throughout from the high, from the mid intertidal to kind of down to the low intertidal. Some snails though, you're only gonna find in the low intertidal, like these beautiful top snails here um, on the right. Uh, purple urchins are a really good indication that you're in the low intertidal. Um, sometimes you'll find big, congregations of them like this, they actually make those little holes themselves so that you can see them all sitting in like that. Uh, but depending on the type of rock that's out in the in the intertidal, you also might find them just kind of cruising around the, the low intertidal without actually making these little holes that these ones are sitting in. Uh, my one nod to vertebrates in the tide pools are these sculpins. You might um, approach a tide pool and see something dart away really quickly. And that's very likely a sculpin um, like these ones here. Um, they're very hard to see once they actually hang out in one place. You can see they camouflage really, really well with their habitat, um, but they are very noticeable when they dart away from you um, as you approach a tide pool. Um, and then finally, thinking about the algae in the low intertidal, this is where you're going to start finding kind of big types of red algae, big blades of red algae, and also the kelp that um, you'll find in the, the low intertidal and also all the way down to the subtidal as well. So definitely kelps are a good indication that you're in the low intertidal. Um, so that is a very, very quick walk through the through the tide pool diversity. Um, but what, what Rebecca and I wanna do is actually kind of highlight a few cool species that we found, some cool interactions that we've had or interesting things that we found in the tide pools since we go out there so often. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Rebecca to talk about this amazing creature. All right, so I'm gonna tell a quick story about this amazing nudibranch. Someone asked in the chat about how big nudibranchs are. They're very small. This one is probably one, to, probably two inches at the biggest. Um, this is called the Spanish shawl, and this is an incredible nudibranch that we've seen in our tide pools south of San Francisco, where we spend most of our time. Um, but this species is usually not found in Northern California. It's much more common in Southern California, but you do find it off our coast during El Nino years or during warm water events. And the first time I ever saw it at Pillar Point, next slide, was um, right after the 2016 election. So this was like a kind of a moment where I was looking for some hope and something good and finding something amazing in times of not feeling that great. And so this nudibranch kind of encapsulates that. It's like El Nino, warming waters, you see it more often. So it's not super great, except it's so beautiful. So it's kind of how I was feeling after the election. And then the last time that I saw it was the first, was right after we started sheltering in place. Um, same thing, Allison and I went out physically distanced from each other and we found this in the tide pools. So it's a beautiful like moment of hope in dark times for me. <laughs> <laughs> so next, <laughs> right. Um, so another cool thing that we found in the tide pools once, this is something that, you know, Rebecca and I are out at the tide pools pretty much every low tide series. So that means that we're out there at least two times a month because um, we have our good low tides usually um, every two weeks or so. And we've been going out to Pillar Point now for gosh, almost nine years. Um, and so very rarely do we see something that we have never seen before, but this was a crab um, that we were out there with our volunteers. And actually it was someone who uh, was coming out with us for the very first time ever. She had just moved to the West Coast um, and she happened to find this crab. And it's this amazing brown box crab that is so weird looking, like no crab that we normally see in the intertidal. Um, and to give you a sense of kind of how big this was, you can see, I think it's Rebecca's holding it right here. And this is what the underside looks like. Now this is a crab that normally lives in the subtidal 
so you wouldn't find it in the inner tidal and it likes sandy places not rocky places like this um, and so it was kind of a mystery of, of why it was there but if you notice this crab it was barely alive when we found it and had this weird hole in its carapace like that we have no idea what what caused that hole or why it was there uh, but it's a species that we've only ever seen once there it's actually not seen very often on the california coast at all um, but we've seen it once we haven't ever seen it again and it's just kind of one of those interesting things that you can find when you visit the tide pools over and over and over again so i'm going to turn it back to rebecca for another story sorry um, no. This I want to tell you, sorry about this amazing animal that probably needs no introduction. This is an octopus, but most people, many people don't know about the East Pacific red octopus, which is found primarily in tide pools. So next, Allison, it's actually pretty small and it can go out of the water a little bit. This is kind of when you see them. A lot of times they're out like this. And so one day we were out in the tide pools and one of our um, volunteers, Robin, saw an octopus next and she was trying to take a picture of it. And you can see here, she was like trying to get a good picture and the octopus grabbed her camera. So this is, Allison took this picture of the octopus taking her camera. And so a struggle ensued and Allison pulled and pulled and pulled on this um, cord that was attached to the camera. And we got the camera back. But the most amazing thing Robin found when she got home and downloaded her pictures was this, that the octopus took a selfie took the octopus took this picture while it was struggling to keep the shiny camera so this is one of the we were laughing so hard this is one of the most amazing um, things that's happened to us in the tide pools <laughs> Um, and then finally, one last story. Um, this is a, um, a spot that's near Pillar Point. Um, this is called Frenchman's Reef. And we were out there uh, last summer with a bunch of volunteers in the early morning. Um, and one of our friends who was out there with us, she found this amazing thing right here. Um, and this <laughs> is a wolf eel, but to be clear, it is only only the head of a wolf eel. <laughs> um, so right away, we had lots of questions about this. This is something that we have never seen. We never, we've never seen a wolf eel in the tide pools, let alone just the head of a wolf eel in the tide pools before. Um, and also, check out those amazing teeth that this wolf eel had, <laughs> too. Um, I ended up posting about it up on Twitter and then had a major fangirl moment for myself when Jane Lubchenco, who is an amazing tide pool biologist and used to run all of NOAA, replied to my tweet about this. And we ended up going down this rabbit hole of one, why, why is it just a head of a wolf eel? Two, why is it in the tide pools? And three, why does it have these crazy pink teeth? So we ended up talking to lots of different people, including one of our curators of ichthyology, which is curators of fish. And he let us know that often when people catch wolf eels, they cut the head off right there and only take the body with them. So we figured that's probably why we found just a head. For the pink teeth reason though, we ended up going to our collections and looked at some sea otter skulls. And you can see these sea otter skulls and their teeth turn purple because they eat purple urchins. Um, and this is your phrase for the evening, a kind of chrome staining is what this is called because urchins are a kind of derms. And so they leave us a kind of chrome staining on the bones and the teeth of these sea otters. Well, it turns out that wolf eels like to eat red urchins, um, which we do have off of our coast. They just tend to be a little deeper than purple urchins in the subtitle, which is where wolf eels live too. Um, and so they end up, their echinochrome staining turns their teeth pink from these red, uh, red urchins. So it was just a fun encounter that we had that let us kind of down this rabbit hole of all these questions and trying to solve all these mysteries that we had about this crazy wolf eel head that we saw in the tide pools. <laughs> so back to Rebecca. All right, so those are some good stories. So we wanted to tell you about an opportunity that you have, like you can also have your own tide pool story and it could be along the California coast, but it could also be anywhere. So we run an event called Snapshot Cal Coast that is actually happening right now, where we ask people all along the California coast to get out and make and share observations of the amazing things that they find, seaweed or fish heads or um, nudibranchs. So next. So we, um, we use a platform called iNaturalist, so you can all download iNaturalist and take pictures of not only tide pool creatures, but creatures everywhere and um, share those observations with a great community. Next. And so we just ask you to go out to the tide pools if you can um, and take those pictures and share them. We've been doing this for a few years. I wanna go kind of quickly. Um, so we've been doing this for five years where we're asking people to make observations. We work with an amazing community along the coast so right now, it's happening between now and November. 
um, any observations you make along the California coast go to our project. Next. And we use these data, you can kind of see what we're finding right now in some of the most observed species. We use these data, we work with the state of California, the Ocean Protection Council, to use these data to help inform management of our coasts. And we're working right now to build an early warning system to help alert us to changes that we're seeing off our coast. But the only way we can do that is by people, hundreds and hundreds of people going out to the coast and making and sharing their observations. So next, and we get an amazing picture of all of the diversity, some of the things Allison showed you and more um, because we have amazing crew of volunteer naturalists who share their observations. Next, so this is one of my favorite quotes. It's from John Steinbeck and it's about the tide pools and your place in the universe. So I won't read it, you can read it and think about the philosophy of looking at small things and big things and small things that are far away. Um, and think about um, how nice it would be if we all could be in the tide pools right now. So we hope you enjoyed hearing about um, our travels through the tide pools. And I think we have a few time for a few questions that Lynn might read to us. <laughs> Hi, I Hi. love Hi. those stories. Uh, they were so fun. Um, we do have a couple questions. The first one is what percentage of the California coast have tide pools? Yeah, I saw that question and I was actually trying to find an exact number. It's actually a pretty small percentage. I think it's small, less than 15%, but I can't find the exact number, but they're pretty, pretty rare. Um, there are some pretty big reefs or pretty big rocky areas, but as far as a type of habitat along the coast, they're pretty rare. The second question, well, comment and question. I've heard that the waters around Pillar Point are some of the most polluted in our area. Is this true? And if so, what are the effects on the creatures that live in the tide pools? Yeah, so um, we have a lot of water quality monitoring that happens along our coast. And it turns out that it's actually Pillar Point Harbor that's not so great in terms of um, their water quality right there. So the, the reef is actually outside of the harbor. The harbor is right next to the reef, though. Um, and so while I wouldn't necessarily recommend, like, swimming in the harbor or eating things that you find out of the harbor. Um, luckily, because Pillar Point is uh, exposed to the open ocean and gets those big waves rolling through, um, that the actual water off of the reef itself is, is pretty comparable to the rest of the state. Um, so from what we know, it doesn't have any effect on the actual reef creatures. I'm sure in the harbor, though, it probably has effects on the creatures that live in the harbor. What's your favorite tide pool? And is there anything we should be careful about if we go? Um, maybe I'll go first and Allison yeah. can follow up. I think that the place that we showed you, Pillar Point, is actually probably my, my favorite tide pool. Um, I love it for so many reasons, um, partly because we are so lucky to spend time there, but also because it has a lot of different uses. Like it's, it, I love marine protected areas and I do a lot of work to protect those areas and to communicate about them. But Pillar Point is a place that you can go fish with a fishing license and it's a place that you can surf and it's a place you can have your dogs on the beach. and um, so it kind of brings everyone. And um, so you have this really cool community feeling of people enjoying the ocean and protecting the ocean for lots of different reasons um, in that one place. And so that's something I love about it. And one thing you should be careful of is really you should remember to be conscious that you are walking many times on animals and be careful and cautious and you shouldn't collect anything without a permit um, of any kind. So um, those, are, those are the things I think you should be careful, but no animals really can hurt you. But maybe yeah. Alton has a different story that she can share. <laughs> <laughs> I did get bit by a worm once that has a whole crazy story around that, but we won't go into that. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite spots is um, a place called Coleman Beach up on the Sonoma Coast. I love Pillar Point too, and it's probably one of my favorite also. Um, but Coleman Beach is an interesting spot because there used to be stairs down to the tide pools there, but um, due to big storms that we had, they eventually fell into the water. And so it's actually a spot now that... Um, you can still walk to, you have to walk a little ways up the beach to get to, but it feels very untouched during normal years. Right now, it's actually really kind of buried in sand for a weird reason. But um, when you go there, sometimes it feels like no one's ever been there because like, because there isn't easy access to it anymore. You just kind of find cool stuff and it feels very untouched, um, which is one of the things I really love about that spot. That sounds great. And then we have one last question. Do we have any endangered species that live in our tide pools? Yeah, um, we do. Yeah. So, um, for example, some species of abalone that we have in the typhoons, especially black abalone, um, are one of our more common um, or well-known endangered species uh, that we have in the typhoons. 
Yeah, we also have a few marine mammals that are endangered that come visit our tide pools. So there can be an occasional sea otter. Well, definitely sea otters off the California coast are an endangered species. Um, and stellar sea lions, I think, are still threatened, but I'm not sure. But And you also sometimes can see whales. But as far as invertebrates, um, the, the abalone are the, the ones that are endangered. Yeah. Great. Um, thanks so much, Rebecca and Allison. Up next, we have Alex Troutman. Hope you're muted, Alex. <laughs> Unmute yourself. Hey, my name is Alex Troutman and I'm a wildlife biologist. Um, I'm gonna be talking about Kins Ridley Sea Turtle. I have worked with them um, for the last couple of years down on the coast of Texas at Padre Island National Seashore. All right, so before I talk to you about the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, uh, I guess I should tell you what a sea turtle is. Um, so a sea turtle is a large omnivorous. So omnivorous is an uh, animal that eats plants and animals. Um, so they're a large omnivorous aquatic reptile. So even though they're aquatic, um, they still have to come up and breathe air because they have lungs. And a cool thing about sea turtles is once they hatch, um, they usually do not come back ashore unless they are a nesting female or if it's a male, if it's injured or sick. Uh, there are a group of green sea turtles down in Hawaii um, that are known to bask in the sun. So they'll come up and bask on the island in Hawaii, whereas all the other sea turtle species, um, the males and females don't come back to shore unless the females are nesting. So sea turtles. They're in the order of Tessodon, and then they're in the family uh, Colonidae, except for the letterback sea turtles. So Colonidae is the group of hard shell sea turtles. So of those hard shell sea turtles, you have the Oliver Ridley, the Loggerhead sea turtle, the <clears throat> Hawksbill sea turtle, the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, and the Green sea turtle. And all of these species, all six of those species, can be found off the coast of the uh, United States, and then, excuse me, <clears throat> all six of those species that I mentioned above are uh, endangered or threatened, and two of those species, the Kim's Ridley sea turtle, which I'll be talking about later, and the Hospital sea turtle are critically endangered. All right, so here's some information about the Kim's Ridley. So it's named after uh, the fisherman who discovered it, or first described the species um, in the early 1900s. And I use the term discovered on quotation because there were or native people here before. So uh, they most likely um, discovered it and described it first. Um, but this is the person who has recognition at the moment of discovering the Kemp's Ridley species. Um, so with the Kemp's Ridley species, um, the adults, they're an olive green um, color on their carapace, the top part and the bottom part of the shell of the turtle is a light yellow on the plastron. And a cool way to kind of remember what like the top part of the turtle shell is called um, and the bottom part is called, if you take the P in plastron and lay it on its back where the hump is up, if you were to cut that in half and pull it out, you will have the C uh, for carapace. Sorry, can't see. You have the C for carapace and then you have a flat line um, that's on the bottom and you put that together and it makes like the dome shape like the turtle. Um, and that will be combining and making the plastron. So, you know, the plastron is the bottom half and the carapace is the top half. Uh, one cool fact about turtle, um, sea turtles and all other turtles is with these turtles, the actual skeleton, their vertebrae is actually fused to their carapace. Um, so they don't really have like a skeleton floating in their body like we do. Um, but the carapace, the top part, the skeleton is actually fused to it. And sea turtles um, cannot retract their head into or at least 
retract their head like other turtles can. So whereas like red ear sirens can retract their head and somewhat all the way into their shell, but sea turtles cannot do that at all. They can't retract their head. So the Kemp's really sea turtle is on the smallest of the 70 sea turtles. They're about 70 to 100 pounds. And then with the Kemp's really sea turtles, uh, they're one of the youngest sea turtles uh, or they're the sea turtle that reaches sexual maturity at one of the youngest age. So around 10 to 12 years, uh, they're able to reproduce. And then they're, another thing that's special about them is they're one of the only sea turtles that actually nest during the day. Uh, so later on, I'll show the video where you can see them like nesting during the day, whereas all other sea turtles, uh, they come up at night and nest. So with these guys, um, they, them, the Kemp's really sea turtles and the olive really sea turtles, um, they nest in synchronized groups called aerobatas. Um, so it's basically just a lot of sea turtles coming up at once out of the ocean um, to nest. And then Kemp's really sea turtles, they can nest every one to three years. They don't nest consecutive years, but they actually skip um, years of nesting. And they can do this because they actually start um, store their sperm. So with them, like not only do they nest every one to, one to three years, but they actually can nest multiple times a season. So usually um, they will nest two times and it's usually um, 14 to 20 days apart where they would um, lay a nest and then go back to the water and come out a couple weeks later and lay another clutch of nest, uh, lay another clutch of eggs. Um, so these guys can lay between 60 and 100 eggs um, per nest. Um, and then a cool thing about the sea turtles um, that I work with in Padre Island. So with Texas, the highways, the beaches are considered highways. Um, so we actually, um, to protect the turtles, we actually collect their nests and play them in incubation rooms in order to help them um, hatch. And once they hatch, we um, release them. So I have a couple of videos to show you. They're really short of on um, some of the nesting behaviors. So this is the first video. Um, this turtle had just got done nesting and it's actually returning to the water. So you can tell like it's in the daytime. So they come up and um, anywhere between an hour or so, they'll lay their nest and then they'll go back into the water. And then this next video shows a Kim's Ridley. Um, she had just got done nesting and she's covering up her nest. Um, so they'll cover it up to make sure uh, it's packed down real good. And then they'll go in, back into the water. Um, but Kim's Ridley and other reptiles, so with most reptiles, their um, sex is determined by the temperature of the nest. So with Kim's Ridley sea turtles, the nesting um, temperature depends on if it's between 82 degrees and below, it's usually going to be a male. And if it's above 88 degrees, um, the temperature it will be, if the temperature is 88 degrees or above, it will be female. And anything in between um, the temperature, those temperature can be either or. So the extremes are either 82 below is a male and then the 88 and above is usually a female. All right, so where do these guys live and what do they eat? So these guys mostly forage on crabs, but they also will consume sea jellies or jellyfish, and then mollusks and other fish. And then you can find these guys in the um, Gulf of Mexico and on the eastern um, U.S. And in some cases, you can find them all the way on the other side of the world. So these guys have been found uh, in Morocco. <clears throat> Uh, but mostly, most of them are in the Gulf and the eastern United States. It's just some outliers are found across the ocean. So these guys spend their early years of their life after they hatch um, in the open ocean foraging for food. And then so they spend the years about two to three years or until they're about eight inches. And then when they are done, they'll once they're older, they'll come back to the shallow water. water 
and then they'll be in the nitro zone. So the nitro zone is the zone after the inner tidal zone. Uh, it's still shallow, but it's not as shallow as the inner tidal zone. So that's where these guys will forage and eat on um, and just live out their life until it's time to reproduce. All right, so let's look at some of the numbers for um, the Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtles. So estimatedly in the early 1940s, these guys were around 40,000 females. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, with the invention of the like refrigerated truck and um, due to a harvesting, these guys, their numbers got down to around 300 to 400 um, nesting females in the 1980s. Uh, I'll show you a video of uh, what they look like in the early 1940s. So this is around 1947. So as you can see in this video, there's thousands of them that are on the beach at this one time. So this is what an uh, arabella looks like. So the synchronized nesting, all of them coming out of the water at once to nest. So over there, that they estimated that that was around 40,000 um, sea turtles from the entire clip that was nesting in 1947. And then um, today, there's around 7,000 to 9,000 nesting individuals. So it's not as high as the 40,000 nesters in the 1940s, but it definitely has improved from the 300 to 400 nesters in the early 1980s. And the reason that they have been proved is because of uh, new enforcement laws and restrictions um, to help the population um, grow. Excuse me. So today, 90 to 95 percent of the nestings for Kemp's Ridley's occur in Tolupa Pass, Mexico. And then there's a secondary population that occurs I'm here in the United States off the coast of Texas. All right, some threats to the Kemp Ridley on sea turtle. Really, all sea turtles are fisheries bycatch. Um, so sometimes they get caught in trolley nets, like from shrimp boats and stuff. Um, with that, uh, one cool thing that came out of them getting caught in the, the nets so much is TEDs or turtle exclusion device. Uh, which is basically a, a device that allows the turtle to uh, bounce off and exit the net, uh, whereas the uh, other fish and items that they're being caught um, are, are staying in the net. And then pollution is another big problem. So this is a Texas, a Texas beach right here. Um, you can't really see, but there's a lot of plastic and other debris um, that are on this beach. And many times, like hatchlings can get caught in those debris and in the plastic, or that before they actually make it to the um, beach, um, they can be ingested or also entangle other entangled sea turtles into <clears throat> in this um, garbage. Uh, and then balloons is another big problem. Like balloons, they are shiny and they look like fish. But also, some of them still have the ribbon on them that can wrap around and entangle uh, sea turtles and other marine life. Like balloons shouldn't be released uh, because they don't go straight up. They have to come back down, which can mess with marine life, but other uh, wildlife as well. And in both of these nets right here, this bottom net is a gill net, which is illegal to use off the coast of Texas. But we found this uh, on our beach, and there was actually some turtles in here that did pass because they drowned. Uh, so this is a big problem is illegal fishing and not using the right equipment. And then the next picture of above is kind of the same thing. It's a anchor uh, that's used for bait line, but all of this, there's wire, like plastic wire and rope on it. So all of this, the anchor was around 10 pounds, and it was wrapped around a sea turtle's uh, flipper. I'll show you in that picture, the sea turtle that it was wrapped around. 
But some other threats are global warming and then also predators. And then harvesting by humans. So in some countries, it's legal for um, sea turtles and their eggs to be harvested. Um, but in here and then also in Mexico, it's, it's, illegal, it's illegal, but it still occurs in both of those places. Um, so those are some of the threats. Um, so what can you do? So this sea turtle right here is Tyson. It's the turtle that had the 10 pound anchor and the wire and rope wrapped around his flipper. You can kind of see like um, the bruise and injury right here on his flipper. Um, so some things you can do to help minimize and help not only kills really sea turtles, but all sea turtles and other marine and beach life is Make sure you're discarding your nets and fishing stream properly. Don't just like throw it on the ground or throw it, throw it back in the ocean, but uh, pack it out with you. And then if you see it on the beach, take it up, take it with you and um, don't just leave it for the next person. Uh, you should participate in beach cleanups because many times marine debris or plastics are washing on the beach and they're <clears throat> They're getting, they're just staying there on the beach. So they're becoming a problem for um, any sea life or any beach uh, wildlife that is going to be on there. They're becoming a problem because they look like food or they're easily entangling other uh, sea life. And then make sure you, like again, I said, make sure you refrain from releasing balloons because what comes up uh, has to come down. And if balloons, like, not only do they, destroy or kill off marine life or any other wildlife by ingesting or they get tangled in the ribbing, but also they can get caught on power lines and cause fires and, and we don't want that. Um, so make sure you like don't release balloons. Um, another thing that you can do to help with wildlife to help marine life is turn off your lights. So sea turtles, um, especially the hatchling use the moonlight to navigate back to the ocean once they hatch. But if you were to leave your porch lights on, if you live on a beach, you can disorient them and have them go the wrong way farther inshore and start going out the shore. And then a big one is never disturb a nesting sea turtle, nest or the hatchlings. Um, there are wildlife um, there. A lot of them, like I said, are in danger or threatened. So you want to give them the best opportunity to be able to survive and reproduce um, for the next generation. So don't disturb them. And then a couple more, um, make sure you clean up your beach lounge equipment. So like tents and like lounging chairs, beach chairs, because those can easily become obstacles and entanglements for um, sea turtles as well. And then like the big thing, another big thing is filling your holes and knock down sand castles. Because while while some kids think it's cool, like dig sound castles and make a giant hole, like and that's cool, but make sure you fill it in because sea turtles can fall in there and not be able to get out. So definitely make sure you're like covering those holes up and taking down your sand castle. And lastly, do not feed wildlife. Um, if you are continuing to feed wildlife, especially on the beach, like you're going to make those wildlife like so if you're feeding the birds you're gonna make those birds condition to the beach so let's say hatchlings are coming up and these birds are right there they're gonna automatically go for the, the hatchlings and be prepared for them so just don't feed wildlife you don't want one you don't want them to get used to humans because if you feed wildlife they can get used to humans and then they'll either have to be uh either removed or harassed or sometimes taken out taken out um, because they become a threat to uh, beachgoers. All right, do you guys have any questions? Hey, Alex. Yes, they have some questions for you. Um, thanks so much for sharing, and thanks so much for sharing those really specific um, actions for helping protect sea turtles. I think a lot of people always want to know how they can help. So, um, but I question about nesting. And so you mentioned that the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles um, are the only species to nest at during the day. Is there a benefit to nesting at night that you know of? Um, I mean, I wouldn't, I would say like maybe the night has like 
it's darker, so they can easily um, blend in. The, like the sun isn't out, and then maybe there's less predators out. Mm -hmm. um, as far as them nesting in a day, um, like you would think, like with all other sea turtles, it, they nest at night. So you think like they'll be the way to go, but on um, nesting a day, like I, uh, it's just evolution. Like it's it's kind of weird because like for me, like especially like I would think like under the cover of night is the best way to nest. But for some reason, they evolved to nest nest during the day. Um, if, if the ocean, so you mentioned about how, um, the temperature determines the sex, uh, somebody had a question that if the ocean temperature continues to warm, will that create a problem for breeding in the future? Um, as far as, I'm not really sure as, as far as that, I just know like for the nest temperature. So if the ground, if the ground temperature is increasing, mm -hmm. that can most likely sway uh, what, um, what proportion of females and males there are. So with the females being a higher, <clears throat> being a higher temperature, if the earth is continuing to warm, that can like mess up the proportions. So there will be more females than males. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the ocean warming, I, I don't know how that will affect the actual reproduction, but if you're looking at ground temperatures, um, that can mess it up. Um, and then people also just wondered, how did you end up working with sea turtles on the Gulf Coast? Um, yeah, so I ended up working with the sea turtles, the Kim's Ridley is um, kind of by like, a uh, lucky draw like I did like I have a degree in biology and I worked with uh, at the at the Georgia Aquarium so I interpreted about um, green sea turtles um, that we had at the aquarium and then um, after I graduated I did some time up in Wisconsin getting um, biology experience up there with the Fish and Wildlife Service and mm -hmm. uh, I have I applied to this position um, with the National Park Service, and I got it. Like, I wasn't really sure because, like, of, about it because, like, I'm thinking like sea turtles. You have to go out to where they are. They're in the water. Um, so I never actually put together like I could work with sea turtles on land. So I never thought about working with them until I actually got the job. I was like, oh yeah, they're, they're coming to me. I don't have to go out on the boat. Um, so that's kind of how I got started, but it's funny now because now I actually, um, for one of my other jobs, I actually do go out on a boat. I'm oh. um, sorry, so I work on a dredging boat uh, when I'm not in school. And so I basically are, am out there making sure that they're not um, picking up any sea turtles or other marine life while they're digging up sand to uh, renourish the beach. Uh. Cool. Um, and then, we have time for one more question. Um, so when you're working, when you're done working with these turtles, what was one of your most inspiring moments with them? Oh, I think my most inspiring moment was actually like seeing the complete nesting um, cycle. So we're driving on the beach, um, patrolling, looking for our turtles or their tracks. So my very first day out patrolling for the turtles, a Kim's really came out of the water. It was, it was like so majestic. It just came out and the waves was crashing and you can finally like see the head and the shell come out and you get to watch it crawl across the sand and go to the, the dunes and then it starts digging and it's just, it's, it's kind of like fairy tale. The sand is just flying over, over his body that's digging out and then you watch it and then um, with us, like it goes into a, a trance so we're able to go up to it and uh, do scientific take scientific data. So we uh, measure it, we collect a skin a skin sample from it, and then we also insert tags, so electronic tags and then metal tags. And we're able to do that because they're in that trance. And once they get out the trance, they'll drop out, they'll dig up and cover up their eggs, and then they'll travel back to the water. And it was just, it's just beautiful, like to experience that and to see them 
come out of water, dig, lay their eggs, cover it up, and then go back to the water and disappear. So that's kind of like one of my favorites experience. Yeah, that yeah. sounds beautiful. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us, Alex. And um, up next, we have Dr. Eileen Maldonado. Night. Bye. Thank you all. Did the mute thing. <laughs> okay, I'm off mute. Everyone can hear me now? I hope so. Okay. So my name is Dr. Eileen Maldonado, and today I'm going to talk to you about chemical communication in the ocean. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Moat Marine Laboratory, which is located in Sarasota, Florida. And I'm also a science ambassador for Blue Endeavors. Uh, which is located in uh, Alameda, uh, California, so in the Bay Area. What is chemical communication? So basically chemical communication is the study of marine chemical ecology. So how these chemicals that these organisms produce, we call them secondary metabolites because primary metabolites are the compounds in the organism that are necessary for basic functions whereas secondary metabolites, not all organisms have them. And so they're used for these kind of alternative things like communicating and pheromones and things like that. And so this is kind of a new field of study because we have new technology to, so we can actually uh, monitor these compounds and identify them. A little outline, we're gonna talk about introduction of what marine chemical ecology is, pheromones, talking about foraging for food, dominance, and chemical defense. And I did want to mention that Mark Hay um, is a pioneer in this field, and I did take some examples from his publication in 2009. So to start off with, um, people have been, scientists have been studying uh, marine organisms and their interactions for centuries, but only recently have we been able to kind of understand the chemical signals that mediate these interactions. Um, Marine natural products or these chemicals um, are as diverse as the functions that they serve. Um, there's over 7,000 of these natural products that we've identified so far, and they come from all walks of organisms, in marine organisms from clams to crabs to fish to corals and algae, all, everything in between. So these chemical cues can be incredibly strong, so strong in fact that they can cause crabs to, um, to uh, grab, protect, and even mate with a golf ball that is laced with these chemicals, with, laced with a pheromone from the female. So it's so, these chemicals can be so strong that it'll oh, impact and they will you know, mate with these golf balls even though visually they can see that it's not a female. So unlike marine organisms, humans, really rely more on our visual cues and our auditory cues. We're not really well designed for understanding chemical communication. However, there still are remnants of that. And I think most people would agree that this gentleman here, uh, Brad Pitt, is uh, an attractive man. And so a lot of a study done by Thor Hill in 1999 actually looked at um, women and how attracted women were to men. And they found that women found men with symmetrical faces uh, that they smelled better. And so even though we think we're out of this chemical loop, we actually still might be affected uh, even though we don't realize it. Another example for humans and chemical cue sense is when we eat a peach. So peaches are very sweet, but the pit is very bitter. And there's a reason for that actually. There's an evolutionary adaptation for that. Um, the reason that they're bitter is actually, they think it might be linked to the fact that they are, they do produce a toxin. So if you were to ingest a uh, peach pit, it actually can produce a toxin, uh, a cyanide really inside of it. 
So they believe that there is an evolutionary ad mutation and adaptation that humans evolved to taste this bitter taste that indicates, okay, I shouldn't eat this, it's toxic. And ocean animals kind of sense the chemical cues in a very different way um, because they're in the ocean and they actually have water surrounding them all. So they're actually able to absorb these chemicals, not only through their mouth or their nose, but kind of all over their body kind of here. Whereas humans were more used to having the senses being separated, you know, our smell, our taste, our hearing are all very separate. Uh, but in this case is these chemicals can be absorbed through the nose and the mouth and the gills all at the same time. And for organisms like corals, they have polyps and mouths all over their body. So they can actually absorb these chemicals over their entire body. So kind of my first example of chemical communication is uh, the anglerfish. And so this is a video by National Geographic and it's one of the first videos uh, documenting uh, the anglerfish with an attached male. So the first live specimen they've ever videoed with an attached male. And what do I mean by this attached male? So yeah, this is the fan fin sea devil. So this male, uh, you can kind of see it there. This is the female anglerfish. And the way they sexually reproduce, so you can see the male kind of right there. So the way they actually sexually reproduce is that males, when they're born, their primary goal is to find a female. So they actually aren't able to hunt for food. So the only thing their main goal is when they're born is to find a female. And so once they find a female, they will attach themselves to her and live off her blood and her nutrients from her hunting. And they will almost become a parasite on her body and just siphon off the nutrients, but they provide her sperm. Um, these fish, there's only about, out of the 300 species of anglerfish, 25 of them uh, reproduce in this manner. And so these males, um, basically only 1% of them ever find a female. The big, deep, dark ocean, uh, so it's very hard for them to find a female, so only 1%. So the kind of joke is that, you know, the 99% kind of die of starvation as virgins. <laughs> and so that's uh, kind of funny. And so here is a zoomed in version of the male. And you can see here that they have these really big nostrils. And they actually have the biggest nostrils in proportion to their head size than any other animal on the planet. And the reason they have this giant nostril is to find the female. So the female releases a pheromone and a chemical cue that the male can detect. And so that's the reason when they're born, they have these giant nostrils so that they're able to find the female. And that's that's the primary way they find her. But then once they get closer, they wanna make sure that it's not a different anglerfish. You know, they could have been attracted maybe to another female. And so and another assurance of that is that they have these really big, well-developed eyes. And the female anglerfish here, I don't know if you guys remember from Finding Nemo, um, she has a light that she uses to attract prey and to then feed on them. But they also believe she uses this light to attract the males. And each species actually has a very specific light pattern and filamentation and the way it's oriented. And the way they light up is very specific to each species. And they believe that's another way that the male can be sure that he's found the right female. It would be pretty bad if he attached himself to the wrong female. And so that is another way that they're able to find a female and make sure it's the right species. Um, another great example of chemical cues and reproduction is barnacles. So barnacles, um, they release egg and sperm uh, into the water column as well, but they actually need to have internal fertilization. So they need to actually be physically close to the next barnacle in order to reproduce. And barnacles are sessile organisms, which means that they are attached to the bottom and they can't move or walk away. So they need to make sure when they end up settling or picking a house that they pick the right place. So for barnacles, once they mate, they release these egg bundles into the water column and they metamorphose kind of like a butterfly. And they have different phases in the water column that they change to. 
But once they're ready to settle, you know, they're ready to find a home, they're ready to have some kids, um, they need to figure out where. And so these tiny organisms don't really have very good visual cues. So the, only, the main relying way that they find a place to live is through chemical cues. And so like humans, you know, they wanna know what the area is gonna be like, you know, they need to make sure it's gonna be safe. Um, they need to think that they're hopefully there's under barnacles around um, and they're not gonna, they're gonna make it till survival till adulthood. So humans, the probably the way they would do it is maybe ask neighbors or ask friends, you know, like, where should I live? You know, is there a good school in this district? Um, kind of barnacles do a little bit of the similar way where um, the barnacle adults actually release a glycoprotein chemical um, and signal that signals to the settlers, hey, I grew up to adulthood here. It's a safe neighborhood. You guys should live here too. And so this chemical it allows these organisms to know, okay, there are other barnacles here. It seems like a good place. I'm gonna to try to settle here. Not only that, but when a new juvenile larvae settles, they also release this chemical. But not only that, they actually, when they're deciding to settle and they're bouncing around, they actually leave a trail of that chemical as they go along so that other, um, other ones can follow them and settle where they've found it. So it's kind of like a little breadcrumb trail of chemical that they leave behind that they can actually, other organisms, and other settlers can actually follow, other little baby barnacles can follow them. Um, so this study, this is another chemical cue. So this is a research that I'm currently doing right now, and that's kind of why I'm in this dorm area. I'm actually at the Moat Marine Facility in the Keys uh, doing this research actually tonight with some interns that are helping me out right now while I give this talk. And so corals are very similar to barnacles in that they are sessile organisms. And so you can see in this video here, and when they spawn and they reproduce, they release eggs and sperm into the water column. And those eggs and sperm meet each other and uh, they turn into little larvae. And so planula is what we call it. Um, so the way they coordinate this is usually through the moon and the sun and the water temperatures but the exact night that they're gonna release their eggs and sperm, we believe it might be chemically mediated. So we believe that there might be a chemical that's released that's like, hey guys, let's spawn tonight. It's really important that they all spawn on the same night uh, because they wanna make sure that the egg and sperm find each other. And so we're actually doing this uh, with Montastra cavernosa. So you can see a picture here is the tanks we have all set up. And here is when we put the black light on them so you can kind of see they fluoresce. Um, and we, we're gonna collect water samples from there and we're actually gonna put it on a new kind of instrument that's uh, been evolved now, it's uh, the Orby trap. And we can actually put the water samples through there and um, identify the compounds that are in that water column. So it kind of can tell us like what are the highest concentration of compounds in there and it's not specific. So we're kind of trying to figure out looking at everything and trying to see what chemical might be the one that's initiating this spawning. Another cool example of chemical communication is actually lobsters and crayfish. So lobsters and crayfish fight to establish dominance uh, for the females to access the females. And so what happens is when they do do these interactions and they fight, you can actually at the end establish which one has won and which one has lost. And they'll actually have a pheromone or a smell of like the winner and the loser. So the dominant and the submissive will have like smells that are released. And what's the reason for that? It's so that they don't, when they meet the next time, they don't have to fight again. When they meet up again, they can be like, oh yeah, I beat you. I won, I don't have to fight you again, or I lost, I'm not gonna fight you again. So they don't have to waste energy fighting again and again when they know they've already fought one time. And this chemical is actually released through the urine and it's shot out through the gills. So the chemical signal not only, you know, signals the status of the sender, but also influences the status of the receiver. So a study done by Moore in 2005 uh, looked at this and they actually exposed crayfish for five days to the smell of a winner, a dominant person. And what that did was it caused the crayfish to become submissive or like feel like he lost and he lost all future fights after he was exposed to that. 
So it actually changed the neurochemistry of the brain of the crayfish and changed its behavior from then on. And the same thing happened when they exposed a crayfish to the submissive's chemical cue or like the loser's smell. And it became like, it acted like a dominant and it won all future fights that it had after that. So it's very interesting. Not only that, but when they um, uh, removed the smells and they allowed them to fight, they actually fought for longer and it was very difficult to tell who won. So I know you've all been waiting for this, but this is two crayfish fighting. Um, I know it's not as exciting as <laughs> it sounds. It sounds way cooler, but it's a little slow. Uh, when I watch this video, it makes me think that they probably do need chemical cues to tell who's winning and who's losing because I really have a hard time telling who's winning and who's losing. And so, yeah, two crayfish uh, battling it out. So to move on uh, to more chemical defense. So I mentioned the peach pit and the evolutionary adaption of like something tasting bad or being bitter can be an indication that it's toxic. So I wanted to see if this also applied to corals and soft corals. So soft corals are known to produce kind of secondary compounds that are toxic to prevent fish from eating them. So in collaboration with Slattery and myself, like we, they laced coral, um, food pellets with this coral and they tested this on the butterfly fish that always eats this coral. So this one is specialized for it. It always eats the soft coral. And when they did lace these pellets with it, they found that they ate 95 to 100 percent of the pellets. So that was expected because they eat it on a regular basis. But when a butterfly fish that never eats it, that's not in its diet, was fed this, it only ate 25 to 50 percent of the food pellets. So that might be an indication that it might have tasted bad, so it might have been distasteful to it, so indicating to the fish that, hey, this might be toxic. And in fact, when I exposed um, this compound and this soft coral to uh, the fish that never eats it, you can see that it had 100% mortality at the low and the high dose. But when I exposed this to the fish that always eats it, it had 100% survival. So the fish was in fact right about not eating it, shouldn't eat it because it's distasteful. And that distasteful did actually indicate that it was toxic. So a study that I really love that I'm really passionate about is a study done by Dixon and Hayes in 2012. Uh, the study is so cool. They did a study with Acropora, which is this coral right here. And they also looked at the symbiotic relationship between this coral and this goby species right here and how this goby species removes the algae off the coral. So they wanted to see um, if the coral was actually communicating to the fish or if the algae growing over the coral was actually, you know, whenever the algae grew over that maybe the fish saw it and ate it. So they didn't really know what was happening. So they wanted to do the study to kind of figure out who is communicating to who. So how did the scientists figure this out? So first they did is they grabbed some algae and that algae that grows on there and they took some water from it. They got uh, water also from the space between where the algae and the coral met. Uh, and they also put the algae on top of the coral and damaged the coral a little bit. Well, the algae did. And then they took a water sample from just the coral alone. And then they took a blank water sample. You always have to have a blank when you're doing your research. Um, and then what they did was they actually found a coral area where some of these gobies were and they would, they sprayed the water in a little bit far away from it and saw and tracked how many times the goby fish would go towards that smell. So if the coral, if it would leave its coral and go towards the smell, they would count how many times it did that and how, and how, um, and how much time it took for it to do that. So they track that. And here are the results. So when they had the algae alone, the fish didn't move towards it at all. But when they had the algae and the coral, you can see here that it did swim towards it. And when it was the coral alone, it definitely swam towards it as well. And the control water sample, no swimming towards the cue, towards the water. 
they wanted to make sure that it wasn't that it was specific to that coral species and that uh, that fish species. So they did they picked another Acropora species and they did the same thing. And you can see here that the fish didn't swim towards it. So it is a very unique symbiotic relationship between that specific piece, species of coral and that fish. Not only that, but they found that when the coral, when that when that fish actually consumes that algae, that it's toxic. Uh, the fish becomes more toxic and um, it's better. So it's very mutualistic where it, the fish benefits from having the home of the coral, but it also benefits from eating that algae and then it becomes more toxic itself. So other fish don't want to eat it. So another research that I'm working on is with chemical cues and red tide. So red tide is a really big issue here in Florida. Um, red tide, in case you haven't heard of it, is a single-celled uh, single algae, and it produces a neurotoxin. And this neurotoxin kills, so it's a mass fish killings, it kills manatees, and it smells incredibly bad. It's If it gets into the air, it's like people cough and they can't go to the beach, and it's, it's just there's so many negative effects from the red tide. Um, so with all these fish killings, I kind of wanted to know, do fish... Are they, can they smell these toxins that are in the water? Do they not smell the toxins? So this is research that I'm currently working on to try to figure out, okay, do these, once the toxins are in the water, do the fish swim towards it or do they swim away from it? And so this is a flume design. So uh, this is from the fish ecology lab. Um, but basically uh, we would put the fish in this tank and put the chemical cue through one side of it and we would video it and monitor to see how much time the fish spends on one side or the other. And that can tell us uh, if it's deterred by that smell, if it swims away from it and wants to spend more time on the other side or if it likes it. So it would be interesting to know if the red tide actually attracted the fish because when the fish die, they provide nutrients for the red tide. So maybe it might do that, maybe it wouldn't. So it would be interesting to find out what would happen. And so this is the research I'm currently working on now at Moat. So to wrap things up, um, next time you're in the water and next time you're going diving, you know, it might seem really quiet and peaceful and very beautiful, but there is actually a ton of communication that's happening all around you and you just can't see it. So maybe next time you go diving, think about that. If there's any questions, please let me know. Um, I give talks with Blue Endeavor called Critter Master. So if you're interested in seeing me talk again, there's more talks there. Um, and if you want to know anything more about my research, please visit moat.org. Hi, Eileen. That was great. Um, I love the battle. I have no idea who is winning. Um, <laughs> We do have a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one is about the angler fish. Uh, do a higher percentage of females find a mate? So yeah, I believe that more females do, but sometimes females will actually have two males attached to them. So they can have multiple males attached to them and they actually don't dedicate themselves to finding the males. The males dedicate their entire life to finding her and she just dedicates herself to staying alive and feeding and living a long life so more males can attach to her. Cool. Uh, <laughs> for lobsters, do lobsters smell or taste the chemical signals? So that's a great question. They probably do it both just because they're in the water column. So they're probably tasting it and smelling it at the same time. And so, yeah, um, there's also lobsters that uh, in the ocean that the urine will actually attract other lobsters to the same area that they're in. So yeah, urine is actually a very powerful thing that's used with lobsters. Nice. And then um, do clownfish also use chemical communication with the coral they live in? Hmm, that's a really good question. I don't know of that. I know clownfish um, do use their physical body to rub up against the nematocysts so that they're always, um, they don't get stung by them, but I don't know. That would be a really great question to find out. Then we have a couple questions about how chemical communication could work on, with it being underwater. So mm -hmm. how are chemical signals retained underwater? Don't currents wash away the signals or make them less precise? Yes, so that's definitely part of it. So um, 
that can definitely happen where it can get blown in the wrong direction. But these organisms are so attuned to it that they can they can sense very, very small volumes of them. So they don't necessarily need very high concentrations of them to adapt. But that's it's totally possible that the signal could get wiped out um, at times if there's really high current. Makes sense. Uh, does pollution and climate impact these chemical communication behaviors? And then how did you get into this type of research? Um, so yeah, they actually, there is a concern that with ocean acidification, because the chemistry and the structure of these compounds can be affected by pH, people are concerned that increasing ocean acidification might change the physical structure of these chemicals. And that might impact if an organism can actually read it, you know, if they can, it can still, you know, identify it or not. Um, pollution is a really big issue. Uh, my friend, Lily Maryung did studies where she found that uh, salmon were actually less able to identify predator cues when they were exposed to a pesticide. So there are impacts that they can yeah. happen with pollutants in the water. Um, how I got into this is uh, I just, I guess I've been obsessed with toxicology and the impact of or uh, toxins and pollutants on marine organisms. And that kind of led me down a path of compounds in the water and secondary compounds and how these compounds might, how they talk and communicate. And I just thought it was this such a fascinating world of like mm -hmm. communication that we, we don't see and we're not used to seeing. And so kind of led me down that path and ended up getting my PhD in environmental toxicology and yeah, kind of ended up here at Moat. <laughs> Very cool. And then last question, what affects the severity of red tide year to year? So red tide, that is the biggest question that's on everyone's mind. And there's, it's still so much unknown. I and mean, when we can say we can have ideas, right? Like more nutrients in the water from pollution, climate change, more hurricanes that bring up nutrients from the water. Um, but honestly, like no one really, really, really knows exactly. And that's what they're trying to figure out now because they're getting more severe. I think an example is that like scientists that were studying red tide, it wasn't as a big deal. And so they didn't have enough money to kind of do these large scale things. But now people are moving towards, you know, satellites and drones and trying to like large scale figure out this problem. So we're working on it. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so much, Eileen. We'll let you go back to your corals. Um, Christina, do you want to hop on with me? Yes, here I am. <laughs> thanks to everyone for tuning in and a special thanks to Rebecca, Allison, Alex, and Eileen. Next week, we're back with virtual nightlife, human slash nature, where we dive into the relationship between, you guessed it, humans and nature. The good, the bad, and the complicated. We'll have Jack Wonderly, winner of the Human Nature category in our Big Picture Photography competition. We'll also have artist Jane Kim of Inkwell and a performance by Ruby Ibarra. And we'll also have our first international guest and National Geographic explorer, Gab Magia. And thank you again, all of you, for joining us and your support during this time. If you're able to at all, please consider a donation to the Academy's Relief Fund. We've been closed for six months now and um, and any amount really helps. The donation link is in the YouTube description. And if not, that's fine. Ignore what I just said. And we'd just love to see you again uh, during our program. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notifications about all our live stream programs coming up, um, including next Tuesday, a breakfast club um, with Dr. Dawn Wright on mapping the deep sea, which should be super cool. And of course, virtual nightlife next week. Um, so thank you again so much and have a great night.